Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to the uh, reconstituted uh, Anthony Peak Consciousness Hour. Um, uh, in the sense that we've been away for around about a month, seems like about a million years, and Sarah and I were just discussing how much we were missing the intellectual stimulation we have from this program. Uh, that comes usually from our guests, occasionally from Sarah, and very rarely from me. But let's see how things go today and everything else. Right. Uh, the guest today is somebody who has done a, a, a couple, I think, of talks uh, for Sarah's group down there in, um, in, I suppose, East Sussex, isn't it? I guess I'm never quite sure if it's East Sussex or uh, Kent, but it's East Sussex, isn't it? Uh, a Dr. Gregory Shushan. Uh, who is a leading authority on near-death experience in the afterlife across cultures and throughout history. I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. You're going to tell that I'm reading it because I can't do both. I'm like uh, Ronald Reagan. I can't read and chew at the same time. So I'll read this out and then we we'll dive straight in into it. Uh, he's been the, the, the Parrot Watt Warwick re researcher at the University of Oxford's Ian Ramsey Centre for Science and Religion, scholar in residence at the Centro Incontro Humani, the cross-cultural centre in Ascona, Switzerland, and the honorary researcher Research Fellow at the Religious Experience Research Centre, University of Wales, Trinity St. David. He has lectured at universities in the UK, Ireland and Switzerland and has given numerous talks on his research in nine countries and has appeared on the History Channel. He holds degrees in Religious Studies from the University of Wales, Lampeter, Research Methods for Humanities, Egyptian Archaeology from the University of College London and Eastern Mediterranean Archaeology from Birkbeck College, the University of London. So here we have somebody who is extremely well qualified in so many different areas of, of um, both history and sociology and anthropology as well. So without further ado, welcome, Greg. Welcome to our show. Thanks very much, Anthony. Thanks for having me on. OK, so what, I, what I'd like to do is an area that we are both very, very interested in, in that um, my background is sociology. And when I was at university, I specialised in the sociology of religion. And one of the reasons that I became interested in the, the themes I write about myself was about human experience, the religious experience, and how the religious experience links to ancient beliefs, shamanism and everything else as well. But going through these belief systems is the, the continuing idea of survival after death. It is something that seems to be unique within all cultures and everything else as well. And specifically from that, the phenomenon that is popularly known as the near death experience. And I know this is an area we're both interested in. So just as a bit of an introduction and background, Greg, can you explain to the audience exactly what we mean by when we use the term near death experience and and how that interests you within your own research area? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Um, near death experience, it's essentially when uh, a person either comes close to dying or actually is temporarily clinically dead and, and re resuscitated. And they come back and they have re report having had all kinds of experience in the interim while they were unconscious or, or dead. Um, and that includes most typically um, sensations of having left the body, sometimes an out-of-body experience where they actually see the room and the body below them. Then they enter um, into darkness and possibly travel through at a fast pace or, or at least rise up and find themselves in another world where they emerge into light. Um, in this other sort of realm, they meet deceased relatives, um, people that they knew in life, friends. Um, often there's a being of light, which is um, just some, either can be a, an actual religious figure like Jesus or the Buddha, or it can be just a sort of being of light generically. Um, sometimes that being will assist them through a, a sort of life review where they have a pan panoramic experience of their previous life on earth. And there's a sense of evaluation of that life that they um, you know, are kind of coming to grips with the good and bad deeds that they did. Um, and then they're either sent back to their body by this being or in some other fashion, find their way uh, going back to that body. Sometimes in, in rarer occasions, they'll be more like a physical barrier and they might even have a glimpse of some, you know, paradisical other world, some idealized image, um, and then they yeah, find themselves back in their body. Occasionally, they will actually see the body and, and re-enter it through various means. So, um, and the reason I say, you know, these kind of equivocal uh, comments like sometimes and sometimes it's Jesus, sometimes Buddha, whatever, is because, you know, what, what we'll, sure we'll get into is the differences 
of between NDEs and different people and in different cultures, because there's this sort of repertoire of sub experiences that compose, you know, a, a typical NDE. Um, and, but not everybody has all of those experiences. And this was recognized way back in the early days of uh, near-death studies with Raymond Moody's book, Life After Life. He came up with this set of 15 possible, I think it was 15 um, possible sub-elements to the experience. And, but he was very clear that said, you know, some people will have five or six, um, some people will have other ones not on the list. So it varies quite a lot. And then on top of that, some people will have them, but superimpose their own um, individual and cultural um, clothing upon them, if you will. <laughs> this is an interesting so, point, isn't it? That mm -hmm. near-death experiences, I recall, became very much after after the, the Raymond Moody book mm -hmm. became extremely popular. But we understand it to be from um, research that people has done that it goes back a long way, doesn't it? You know, mm -hmm. near-death experiences reported from even ancient greek reports it seems right. to be something that goes back can you explain a little bit about that to say it's not just a new phenomenon it's something that's been there for a long time yeah that's an interesting thing because um uh, moody named it near-death experience so he he gave it this you know handle this something to, to hang on to whereas before that there wasn't a name for it which is you know in itself a pretty extraordinary thing considering how long they've been going on and by that i mean since all of human history and before human history, um, and that they do turn up in the world's religious, anthropological, explorer, missionary kinds of literature all over the place. So it is interesting that they, they weren't identified um, as this particular phenomenon by anthropologists or sociologists or anybody else. So it took Moody to kind of zero in on that. And then after Moody, um, a lot of researchers started wanting to kind of wriggle out of even what Moody was saying and, and claiming, no, this is just a Western Christian sort of phenomenon. And it's the sign of the times that people want to believe in these sorts of things. So um, when researchers first started uncovering uh, cross-cultural examples, um, Alan Kelly here was a, a sort of pioneer in this. He found a really interesting Hawaiian one, um, James McLennan as well. Um, he found some interesting you know, Japanese and African examples, Chinese, um, Tibetan, Carl Becker. So there were a few who were sort of started, you know, showing that actually this is not just a Western contemporary phenomena um, and doing the legwork to, to demonstrate that. So those were kind of the, um, a lot of the people I started discovering when I, when I started noticing the same kinds of things. So I, I would say, um, you know, I would gratefully say um, inspired by, but one thing that I actually find interesting about my whole process in this is that um, I came to this stuff independently of these people. I came to it from Egyptology and anthropology and religious studies. Can you tell us a little bit about that? That's quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, sure. So how did you first come across the, the experience? And, and yeah, tell us more. That, that is interesting, particularly the, the Egyptian angle as well. Sure, yeah. Um, I, I knew about near-death experiences. They, I, most people do. They're in the popular conscious, pretty much. Um, and I had read Carol Zaleski's book on other world journeys, which she looks at uh, medieval accounts of, of monks uh, and nuns who supposedly die and go to the next world and come back. And, and they're very, you know, didactic religious sorts of texts. Um, but nevertheless, they have lots of similarities with what we know of as the NDE. So that was always really fascinating to me. I didn't really agree with her conclusions all the time. But um, so when I was uh, studying Egyptology, I was reading ancient Egyptian afterlife texts like uh, the Book of the Dead and especially the pyramid texts and coffin texts and I just you know interested and obviously it's a it's a very kind of phantasmagorical uh, realm and universe that that the ancient Egyptians created in their afterlife beliefs I'm very rich um, lots and lots of imagery and symbolism and you can get lost in that and, and the identities of each of the tormenting deities and the positive deities but within all of this, I just started thinking, okay, they're entering darkness, they're coming out into a realm of brightness, they're meeting the sun god, which is a being of light, um, deceased relatives, uh, they're leaving the body and encountering the corpse in the other world, um, which is symbolized by the corpse of the god Osiris, because the dead person becomes Osiris. So it's very... Um, um, a lot of the meanings of NDEs are actually preserved in the ancient Egyptian texts, as well as some of the symbols, but it's a religious text, so it doesn't actually say, you know, 
Pharaoh whoever died and this is what he experienced. It's just kind of extrapolating from the religious texts and mashing it up to, to the NDE is what kind of got me thinking, um, you know, how to explain this in light of other cross-cultural examples, if not by reference to near-death experiences. Were you reading the Egyptian Book of the Dead and the the the, the sacred texts in um, Egyptian or ancient Egyptian as well? Were you or were you in translation? Um, both, yeah. I mean, in in Middle Egyptian, as kind of as exercises for part of the course. Um, so, but it, it's much more effective to read translations. <laughs> yes, but efficient. I can imagine that you know when you when you read something in its in its original form. Mm. the nuances come out don't they you know the, the the cultural aspects because you're using the hieroglyphs and the symbolism of the hieroglyphs as well so that is intriguing in itself and it gives it more level it actually in, it places it within the culture yeah and reading. it also helps to if there's a an, something that's unambiguous or doesn't quite sit right or sound right um, i was able to go look it up and kind of look at different translations and then look at you know piece together what the sentence might mean and um in my own translation which is you know um fairly inept as, as far as like proper egyptologists go but at least i had you know the, the skills and ability to be able to question some of the translations so. do we have any idea um because of course it's incredibly difficult going back that far in history but do we have any idea of where these narratives came from were the narratives taken from people who had died or were they um narratives that people believed in and then people then subsequently started to experience do we know that uh, to no, any great extent that is a great great question and that's kind of that zeroes right in on the you know one of the key issues that um that i was trying to look at and and that led to my first book um no we don't know um because there's um in the early days of, of literacy in egypt writing was used basically for accounting um bureaucracy there was no uh personal narrative there was no you know the, the pyramid text isn't preceded by anything like um we know that this is true because so and so went there and came back and told us um so no what the, the idea for me at this at that point was because of that because of the limitations of the context of the text and its and its um, origins i thought the way to um, utilize that as a comparative set of, of imagery and, and uh, beliefs was to um, compare with other cultures, um, both who did have near-death experiences and, and those who didn't. So meaning that if there are enough similarities cross-culturally, um, where else would those ideas have come from, really? <laughs> yeah, because so. I thought it was interesting that uh, on listening to one of your lectures that you decided that you would use, I think it was Northern India, and the mm. argument that there wasn't any cross fertilization of ideas between the northern indian vedantist right. worldview and that of of, of ancient egypt right. um, and that's an intriguing way of doing it isn't it and it's so important to look at it that way so can you tell us a little bit about that so we had mm. uh, very much if there's any other areas about the ancient egyptian belief systems that you want to mention now that we could come back to that would be good and mm. then if we could move on then to the the, the northern indian worldview as well sure yeah um yeah, I just I would briefly say about the Egyptian stuff is, um, in fact, the talk I, I did for Sarah's uh, e Egyptian Explorers Club, I talked about later examples of possible NDEs, or at least narrative stories that may have been based on NDEs. So I don't think there was, they were, you know, it was a completely alien idea. This, this is, you know, a couple thousand years after the pyramid text, but at least it shows that there is some kind of knowledge of those, those texts, of, of those kinds of experiences, so... Um, but yeah, um, I did um, compared first compared Egypt with uh, the Vedas, you know, early Indian texts going from the Rig Veda up through the Upanishads. Um, there are actually a couple of references, very clear references to near-death experiences in the Atharva Veda and I think the Jaiminiya Brahmana. Um, there's no account, there's not, a, again, any personal account, but they say that they, you know, essentially there are spells for going to the other world and bringing back a soul who's in danger of death, a very kind of shamanic um, type of um, description. So it shows that not only can a soul travel there and come back, um, but that somebody can actually go there and, and help them through that process. Um, I also compared with ancient Sumer. There's, there's Sumer was like, like uh, 
Egypt that there was no context for these sorts of personal narratives. So it was again comparing mythological and religious texts. Um, there is a, a text from Sumer called The Death of Bilgamesh. Bilgamesh was the pre-Gilgamesh version of um, the Epic of Gilgamesh. And there is a what I think is a fairly clear NDE. Um, and he, Bilgamesh, was thought to have been an actual Sumerian king. So there's a argument that that could be the world's first recorded NDE. Um, a lot of that focuses on um, his appearance as, as a decaying, rotting corpse after his journey to the other world and his transformation after realizing um, that you can be dead yet still conscious and surviving your own death, which is um, a major issue of the Egyptian text as well. Um, so then I went on to uh, ancient China and there were some very, you know, clear documentary NDEs in those texts, um, you know, naming individuals, naming the person who, um, that NDE was told to and the date and the province and the occupation. So very careful to, um, you know, demonstrate the actuality of, of those experiences, as well as uh, religious texts that were, you know, very much aligned to NDEs. And then um, the last one was Mesoamerica. I did um, Mayan and Aztec. And there is one um, Aztec example of, of an NDE that um, a missionary from 15 something recorded of a, a princess who, you know, died and came back to life. And, and again, um, their afterlife beliefs, even apart from NDEs, correspond to NDEs to such a, an extent that, um, you know, I, I had to kind of conclude that if there are these basic general similarities in these five ancient world regions, which for the most part had no contact with each other, you know, in the case of Egypt and India or Mesoamerica, China, absolutely none. Sumer in Egypt, yeah, China and India, yeah, but um, these are such early, or early periods that I'm looking at that any claim that they could be, you know, myth diffusion just from one source to everyone else is, is just a complete non-starter, so. Because mm. it's other... isn't it, the challenge when you, you're looking at uh, the Mesoamerican cultures mm. is, and I, I, I stand corrected here, but as, as far as I'm aware, there, were no, there was no actual written language there as such. Um, I think there was things within in North North uh, South, South America wasn't with the knots and things within strings. Right, the Incas had the knots. Yeah, yeah, but there was nothing really other than the narrative that would have been given to the conquistadors, I guess, as they as they arrived. Right. So, in terms of because um, this is fascinating, isn't it? That one could argue putting putting playing devil's advocate here. Hmm. One could argue that one could reasonably taking the Tyler worldview of anthropology and, and the golden bough and sitting there in your, your beautiful armchair in Oxford and pontificating on how ancient cultures may have worked, you know, the very much the Kipling just so stories of history. Right. But effectively one can construct a model whereby you would think, well, um, early man, um, and more traditional communities would come to the conclusion that because I go somewhere else when I sleep and sleep seems to be a similar state to death. Mm -hmm. So therefore, when I die, I'm likely to go into the sky mm -hmm. and I'm likely to rise above. Do you think that is, is a reasonable critique to say that that is possible and therefore we are joining dots that aren't really there and it is basically just the kind of the thing that people would just collectively believe in anyway mm -hmm. um i don't and the reason i don't is because um dreams don't have the same um nine or ten or twelve elements that repeat across all of these unconnected cultures throughout history and also correspond to more recent indigenous societies you know um the the world religions of the world um, and contemporary beliefs in, in different cultures. So, um, you know, there's there's shared dream imagery, I guess, you know, there's, there's all these kind of typical dreams of, you know, your teeth falling out or somebody, you know, dying or whatever. But um, NDEs have this stable context of almost dying. You know, they, they only occur in a context that tells us a person almost died and came back. Um, and they share those, um, you know, this set of elements across cultures. So, That's you know, fascinating. I'm, isn't I'm it? sure dreams contributed because you're right. They, they do. Um, they, they may have reinforced or contributed to 
to NDE mythologies, but um, they also don't have the, the typically anyway, they don't have the, the lasting power that NDEs have, both as, you know, people who have NDEs remember them as if they had just happened um, 20, 30, 50 years ago. They're equally clear in their minds decades afterwards. Um, and they also, they, they always say that they don't feel like a dream, that they were more real than this world. So that's another thing that makes me think um, those are the kinds of experiences that would be more likely to generate um, lasting, you know, deeply ingrained human beliefs in afterlife than just dreams. So. Mm. Yeah, that's fascinating, isn't it? It's such a valid point as well. The people I know that have had near-death experiences, these are the things they say, you know, that mm -hmm. it is more real than real and mm -hmm. that the, the, the narrative is consistent. And as you say, the fact that the moody traits and the grace and, grace and scale mm -hmm. repeats itself historically suggests that we are dealing here with a consistent phenomenon that mm -hmm. is something that is, is universal. Mm -hmm. um, but having said that, one of the things that you, you, you discuss in your books, and I think it's profoundly important, is that there is a cultural veneer that sits over it. So there's the core experience, but it's then how the experience is interpreted by the individual cultures that then becomes the narrative and the belief system of that particular society. Um, yeah. And could you tell us a little bit about that? What things have you discovered that are subtly different in, say, Chinese culture or Indian culture? And, and Mesoamerican culture that are different to each other, that su right. is suggestive that there is a cultural aspect here as well. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's a few. There's, um, I think the, the first one that sort of came to light in, in New Death Studies, um, there was a debate between um, Alan Kelly here and Susan Blackmore, and um, it, that was about the tunnel experience. Mm. And, you know, Susan Blackmore was saying, um, you know, there, there should be, um, she, she's a, um, one of the, for listeners who don't know, our viewers who don't know, she's a, you know, one of the earliest, most prominent debunkers of, of NDEs, um, who argued that it's all in the brain. And so from her, her perspective, um, they pretty much all have to be the same across cultures, because if the dying brain makes you believe that you're going through a tunnel and coming out to light, then there should be a tunnel everywhere across the world. So, um, there isn't a tunnel everywhere across the world. Some people describe just entering sort of vague amorphous darkness. There's no sense of like rushing through an architectural tunnel with a light at the end. Um, so, so even that is, is a very basic difference. Um, other ones are uh, in Eastern cultures. It's often a case that the reason you're sent back from the other world is because there was a case of mistaken identity. So, um, you know, you get there and you're encountering the deities and, and they, you know, it comes to pass that like they got the wrong person named Gregory Shushan. So they send you back to your body and they find the right one. So um, whereas in a lot of Western NDEs, it's more of a case of you need to go back to fulfill something that you didn't do while you were on earth or care for your children or your elderly relative or, or whatever it is. So that's an interesting one. Um, another one, uh, it seems that only in small scale societies um, do they typically have um, uh, the afterlife being reached by walking along a road or a pathway rather than leaving the body and, you know, going through the darkness and in, into a spirit world. They, they just literally walk there and they sometimes will see spirits walking back. <clears throat> and those are ones who had NDEs or are on, on their way back to, to earth, which is also interesting. So, I mean, so something even as ba basic as, uh, leaving the body and floating up, that can be symbolically experienced by an enculturated, enculturated individual as walking along a path to another, um, you know, the spirit part of earth or whatever. Because mm, that, again, is intriguing, isn't it? The, the idea of a journey and a path and getting round the, the argument of, of people like Susan Blackmore that it is just brain created. My counter argument to that will be, well, everything is brain created. Everything is, is processed by the brain and presented to whatever consciousness is within the brain. And we don't even want to go leaping into the hard problem of, of consciousness here, right. but effectively the idea just because they're seemingly hallucinations doesn't mean that hallucinations cannot be real because we don't know exactly what real is anyway. 
uh, particularly as we get more and more into the understanding of, of subatomic particles and how they work with each other. But the, the, the tunnel effect is an interesting one, isn't it? Have you any idea why you think that um, the tunnel effect is, is, is more experienced in, in Western cultures? Is there any re other reason for that other than physiological and the eye shutting down, the, the right. blood supply to the eye and everything else as well? Is there more to that, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, uh, I think maybe what, what Kelly here was arguing is, is probably correct, that um, Western people are more used to traveling at high speeds through architectural tunnels. Or, um, and he also said things like uh, looking down through microscopes um, mm. and just different kinds of visu visual stimuli that, that we have. And we even have a, you know, the expression, the light at the end of the tunnel. So um, it's kind of embedded in our culture in ways that it might not be in other cultures. Um, another one is the life review, which is, um, that's disappointing to a lot of people who, who have, a, you know, a real kind of vested spiritual interest in, in NDEs all being the same or all being a particular kind of spiritual experience that they want it to be. But life reviews are not very common in small scale societies at all. And um, that might be, um, again, you know, barring from Kelly here is he, he, th he thought that um, in, in a community or a society where that's very community-based rather than individual-based, that there might not be any need for an NDE, um, or, or I mean, sorry, for a, for a life review during an NDE. Like, there's no need for like a, a personal reckoning of what you did on earth because it's really about what did the community do on earth? Mm. So there's no um, like self-judgment. And what was interesting about that is he, um, he speculated on that um, in the mid 90s or something and i think you know maybe four or five indigenous ndes were known at the time and um you know being me i'm always wanting to try to prove the opposite of whatever people are saying so so i really paid attention to that in, in researching ndes and indigenous religions and i really looked and there were you know in the i don't know 150 or whatever i found in, in different parts of the world there's only a couple of of life reviews and and it's um that was really surprising to me yeah, um, there were. There's often some kind of evaluation of your life on Earth, like um, you know, did you feed the poor or did you conduct these religious rituals in the in the correct, correctly prescribed way? Um, but as far as an actual life review, the way we think of it, it's it's pretty rare. Mm, one wonders if it could be, and this this will cause difficulty for my own hypothesis on the near death experience. But we have to be open to all you know, as, as, as academics or hopefully academics and taking an academic viewpoint, we have to evaluate all things. Mm -hmm. um, and it could be to do with, we are used to in the West in terms of narratives of our lives, because we have movies, we have films, we have ways of seeing things that have already occurred to us mm -hmm. in many ways in our own past. Whereas in earlier communities, this was not the case. And yet that tends to fall down a little bit when, and again, I stand corrected here, but some of the, the earlier reviews, and I'm thinking of the near-death experience, I think of Thomas De Quincey's mother. Mm -hmm. um, I think De Quincey described it in his, his mother's near-death experience. Um, and she had a panoramic life review. And also mm -hmm. I think there was some admiral that was drowning at some stage. And yeah. he had a panoramic life review. Um, to me, the question has to be, people experience these things and then read up on them and discover that there's such things as the panoramic life review, but it's something that they'd never considered before. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the power of the near-death death experience, isn't it? The, the vast majority of people who have near-death experiences only start reading up on the material subsequent to the experience. Right. You know, and that's what stimulates their interests, you mm -hmm. know, and, and um, you know, sort of... Uh, uh, Penny Satori, who's been a previous guest on this show, you know, she talks and touches upon the thing you touched upon, which is the transformative aspects mm -hmm. of the near-death experience, you know, mm -hmm. and, and everything else as well. But these, these seem to not be universal. So what, what are the core things in the experience that you found that are in all communities? What are the, the, the central things that are probably the core of the experience? Yeah, I would say um, it usually is leaving the body. Um, 
Um, there are quite a few, even, even just trying to find like all, I, I don't think I would be able to say all, but I would say most common. Um, yeah, leaving the body, the darkness, if not a being of light, at least some kind of light or brightness, um, deceased relatives, um, coming to a point that you can't um, proceed any further, and then going back or being sent back to the body. So I would say it's sort of that basic. Mm. So, mm. yeah. So what we have here really is a variation on the out-of-body experience, I suppose. Um, mm. The idea of being disembodied in some way. And and somebody in the, the chat room has made a point here. Um, Nella has, has said, in terms of if you use the term hallucination, you, you can't explain veridical mm, hallucinations right. by just saying it's an hallucination. Um, and that's very true. Have you got any examples of veridical near-death experiences that would support the idea that this is a genuine experience where you are physically outside of your body rather than something that we think we are but in fact it's not um there i mean there are quite a few examples um the chinese ones i mentioned where they were um often very concerned just to follow up the experience with a subsequent event that um was supposedly prove the experience to, to be vertical. So for, for example, a, um, a man dies and goes to the other world and, and sees this person there who he didn't know standing at the right hand of, of the deity. And then 20 years later, he encounters this guy in the street and he says, you know, I recognize you from your NDE and let me explain to you the symbolism of that experience you had and you know, the political regime is going to change and the invaders are coming from the north or whatever. So it had this kind of, you know, obvious political uh, and social context to it. But they were also very concerned with, you know, showing that this this was an experience that actually happened. Um, there are also a lot of uh, examples from indigenous societies, a few Native American examples where they um, will say things that are intended to... to um, show that they were veridical, but don't really, um, you know, convince us because they will say things like, in my spirit form, as I was coming back, I, I carved a mark in the tree and you can go and see that mark in the tree, <laughs> which, um, it, you know, it made, it made sense in that cultural context. And maybe they didn't even have as much of an awareness of like spiritual body versus physical body um, in, in some cases, because it, if, if the experience feels that real, that you're really there, then maybe the, the actual idea of being outside the body isn't, isn't so relevant. That's an excellent point, isn't it? That I'd never thought about that before, that if the experience is so real, you don't, you don't feel that you've left your body because you still feel you are you. Hmm. You're just in a different environment. Right. Experience. That's maybe where the walking down the road thing hmm. comes from as well. Maybe it's not as maybe not as dualistically focused as as we yeah. are in the west i don't know um but it just uh, it just occurred to me too as far as the victorian examples you mentioned a few minutes ago de quincey and, and the admiral beaufort i think it was. beaufort yes it yeah. was wasn't it? um you know it might just be as far as the life review goes i mean they did have photography back then there's this kind of yes. sentimentality in the west of of collecting our lives you know this kind of this mm. constant nostalgia of our own lives as we're as we're living it um so we, we have all these mementos of the past and photographs and we keep diaries and journals and family histories genealogies um and none of that is is for you know who's going to rule this land when i die and proving who's going to rule it these genealogies are just about self-interest really and the interest of the family and where we come from whereas that um that's maybe something that's not present in a lot of other, other cultures yeah that's an interesting point again isn't it because in in literate societies and societies that have writing or that most people can read and write you therefore have evidence of the narrative of your own life and you can record your own life and you can go back and read your words describing yeah. your own life whereas in in pre-literate societies or in societies where the majority of people cannot read and write mm. there is that different association with the past mm. that we have in other words they live almost in a continual present right. and the present moment is just a continuation of the present moment and of course we can then apply can't we the, the idea of 
of the way in which language is structured, you know, whether you're in a language that that is 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 time based and whether you have transitive verbs and whether, the, you know, it's a question mm -hmm. of movement and change. Yeah, that too. You know, and I know that in, in, in many languages in the Indian subcontinent, you know, the, 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 the whole concept of time is very different. The way the verb is formed is very different. And again, I'm thinking here, you know, you could apply the ideas of uh, Edmund, Ed, uh, Benjamin Lee Wolfe and, and, and Saper in terms mm -hmm. of the way in which language structures the way we perceive reality. Mm -hmm. So right. it could be that there's an awful lot of really interesting anthropological work that could be done here mm -hmm. in terms of how this experience works. And I think that's why your work is so profoundly important. And I was only recently talking to a friend of mine about how... I found of profound interest to me when I was doing my, my, my degree was the, the French historians like um, Marc Bloch and various other individuals, the, 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 the Anel group, mm -hmm. where they were writing history from the viewpoint of the peasants, you know, what it was like to be a peasant in medieval society, Marc right. Braudel and things, and the idea that darkness is darkness. You know, there is no artificial light. And mm -hmm. if there is no moon outside, darkness is tangible and it is out there. And then you think, well, maybe that's where the concept of darkness comes within. Whereas, you know, going towards the light in an ordinary non-modern society, the only light source is really the sun and the moon. Mm. So you can't be going towards the light because there isn't yeah. any other light source. That's a point. Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? yeah so moving on then one of the areas that i know that you write about a lot and i know that there's a lot of members of this group or, or our little group anyway who are very interested in in shamanism shamanism and mm. the role of the shaman in terms mm -hmm. of going to the, the other world and bringing information back mm -hmm. did you find many parallels with that with your own research yeah absolutely um and i, I especially focused on um I mean, I should, should clarify that, you know, that term applies to so many different magical religious mm, healing sorts of practices. Yes, yeah. Of so we're, what we're talking about is just basically spirit journeys to other world form of, of shamanism. So, um, yeah, and, and they are, you know, very clearly aligned with NDEs. It, it's almost, um, I would say if you didn't have the context and you just had the description and, you know, you wouldn't be able to tell in, in many cases, um, what was a shamanic experience and what was an NDE. And, and it's almost to the point of like, what was a deliberately induced NDE and what was a naturally occurring NDE? Mm -hmm. Because uh, in, in a lot of societies, um, the, you know, they, they sort of consider it a, an analogous type of experience to the extent where they would do different kinds of rituals to bring about um, a sort of symbolic death that enabled them to travel to, to the next world. So, um, meaning they would, you know, from from fairly, uh, you know, healthy, innocuous things like lying down in a grave um, or um, going through some kind of ritual death ceremony and, and you know, going into a dark cave and coming out or whatever, um, to actually um, clubbing themselves to death is what it would say um in one ac account i found they said they burned themselves to death which is obviously not possible so, so that was probably done in a um you know shamanic kind of context possibly with use of drugs where you're you know experiencing your own immolation and return mm. um but just the fact that it was you know in, in a lot of societies it was seen as something that you had to symbolically die in order to get to the other world so um my conclusion about all of that, it was, um, this is, by the way, is my, my second book, which is um, New Death Experience in Indigenous Religions. And that was ex ex um, comparing um, NDEs in Africa, um, the Pacific Oceania region, and North America. Um, and what I, what I found there was basically that it seemed to me that shamanism, those kinds of shamanistic pra practices were basically an attempt to replicate NDEs for particular healing purposes or, or to rescue the soul of somebody who, who is coming back from the dead. And the reason I say replicate is because NDEs, as we've, we've said, are a cross-culturally probably universal phenomenon that happens spontaneously. It's, you know, people don't normally um, deliberately 
instigate an NDE upon themselves. So in a sense, NDEs, I think, probably preceded shamanism and maybe shamanism was, you know, accidentally discovered by, you know, whatever society. But I think once it was discovered, once people saw it as analogous to NDEs, it became a tool to accessing that same world, um, which is very clear just, just by the fact that, you know, you're going to send your soul into the other world to, to go and literally bring back the soul of somebody who is lying here apparently dead, put them back in their body, and they're going to come back to life, and, and that's their near-death experience. So um, you facilitated somebody having an NDE by virtue of you replicating, um, you know, going into the same realm that, that they went to during their NDE if that makes sense <laughs> well that's a fascinating point isn't it that the the whole shamanic experience is trying to reproduce the near-death experience and it's people reporting the near-death experience that then think, thinks to pick then as the shamans think well how can i reproduce that because one of the things again that uh, has intrigued me in my readings around dmt and ayahuasca and, and other entheogens is again the similarities you have there you know you meet entities yeah. These entities turn around to you and say, you know, you shouldn't be here or you should go back. Or then you have the the kind of the, the shamanic ritual dismemberment right. of the people, which is which is paralleled in UFO law in terms of mm. the abductions and everything mm -hmm. else as well. And it makes you realize that, that, that there is there is something here that's consistent. And one of the things, again, in, in one of your lectures, I found quite fascinating was the work you, you, you had done with indigenous cultures within sub-Saharan Africa mm. and the way in which they, they again, had their own subtly different worldview and mm. understanding of the NDE. Can you, can you discuss that in a little bit more detail? Yeah, that's a really interesting thing. And, and again, that was something that... Um, you know, there's all these scholarly gen generalizations that I think probably all scholars come up against here and there that um, people just take for granted. So one of them was that um, sub-Saharan African groups don't believe much in the afterlife and they, they um, don't focus on journeys to the other world and um, the way that we think about the afterlife is, is very different. Um, and I, I sort of, because of the previous research I'd done, um, I kind of went into it thinking, you know, I'm going to probably prove that wrong. You know, <laughs> I bet the digger, the the deeper I dig, um, the more examples I'm going to find, and um, that wasn't actually the case. I did find, you know, a, a good few examples of NDEs here and there. Um, they were mostly among uh, Bantu-speaking people, and it also corresponded with the idea that Bantu-speaking people had more afterlife myths. That were similar to NDEs, the kind of otherworldly myths that involve. And the Bantu, the Bantu are located in which part of sub uh, Southern, like uh, Zulu and. and oh, it's the Zulu and Xhosa yeah, and everything. Okay, right. okay. Um, so, yeah, they had more beliefs in NDE like afterlife, um, as well as more accounts of NDEs and NDE type shamanism. Whereas other groups, um, was, you know, the, the received wisdom that, that they don't have these kinds of beliefs. And often where I did find examples of NDEs, they were perceived by the local culture as being somehow threatening or aberrant. So um, the, there's a couple of examples, the, the Tanala people of, of Madagascar, um, if somebody came back to life, they would start stoning them to death because they thought that this person was a victim of sorcery and that that was no longer the soul of the person in that body that soul's gone uh, probably to the forest to live with the ancestors. Um, but that body is, you know, animated by sorceress means and it needs to be put down before it causes any damage. So those are not conditions that would facilitate an NDE being reported. <laughs> basically, was, in, in, in one of your talks, it really quite disturbed me was the idea of elderly people uh, were actually put outside of the, the camp and left to die or starve to death or be eaten by wild animals. And I thought, right. mm, that can't be a lot of fun. But, you right. know. Um, well, well, not even being put, but going there themselves in some cases. Right. It's just a kind of acceptance. It's my time to die. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, you know, chill in the forest until it happens. Mm. Um, I mean, the sad thing was that, you know, according to some of the missionaries and anthropologists, some of those people could have been saved with, you know, very simple western medicine but they're like nope it's mm -hmm. it's time to go but um 
but yeah, and then there's another example of a, a, a woman um, who, in the Akan uh, people, she was a victim of human sacrifice and they didn't, you know, kill her enough. So she came back to life and she said, um, I was told by the spirits in the other world that um, I need to be clothed before I go there. I need to be presentable. So let me get dressed and then kill me again. And that's what happened, you know, so there was no like- Do you, do you know, that's one of the one most extraordinary things um, of your work because I was <laughs> listening to that on headphones, sunbathing down in Madeira. <laughs> and you described that particular incident of the lady um, that they sort of, they, they obliged her by killing her again while she was clothed. And I thought, wow, <laughs> that's, um, but it makes you realize how the world is different and we have different worldviews and there's no special worldview of these things at all. They're, they're far more intriguing than that. Yeah. Um, and one of the areas that you, you also touch upon, which again is of great interest to people like Sarah and myself is the, the Orphic mysteries and mm. the, 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 the ancient Greek approach to um, life after death and everything as well. And also a lot of the Jungian archetypes that seem to rise up within this as well. If we can touch upon that for us for, for a while. Yeah, that's, um, I haven't uh, done the, the Greek work much yet. That's gonna be, that's forthcoming a couple of books down the line. I'm gonna do a, um, NDEs in the afterlife in Greece and Rome. Oh, we, we, um, we must all work together on that one. Yeah, actually that would be good. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I do think um, that there are, with ancient mystery cults and Norfolk rites and all these kinds of things, I think there is definitely a, a, an NDE element to them um, because symbolically all the, the typical elements are there. Um, plus we have, as, as you mentioned earlier, actual Greek and Roman accounts of NDEs. So they were very much, I think, in, in the consciousness in, in those periods, so. Because mm, I mean, the, the myth of Ur is is extraordinary, yeah. isn't it? When you you read that and you, you go, wow, this is a, an absolute classic near death experience. I mean, if you could explain to, to everybody a little bit about that, you know, it's extraordinary. It is. Yeah. I mean, it's it, it's absolute classic in both senses that it has um, all of those typical NDE elements, but then also all of this um, incredibly complex symbolic stuff of this you know spinning wheel of the universe and all this you know sort of visionary um experiences on, on top of the typical nde stuff um Ur was a soldier uh, he was described by plato and plato's republic who died on the battlefield and came back to life and, and told about his nde and and um and, and yeah it's it's um it's very long it's very complex and when i read it i can't help but think there is probably um, an actual core of an NDE in here, and there's probably 60-70% of Plato riffing on that NDE and trying to make his own philosophical points. Um, and that's the same thing I feel like when I read a lot of the medieval Christian examples. Mm -hmm. um, any, any example that's, to me, like length is one of the dead giveaways. If it's more than like, you know, a few paragraphs or a page or two, then it's, uh, you know, some of the medieval ones, I think it's uh, Tundale. It goes on for like pages and pages and pages, and there's just no way that he had all those experiences and described them. <laughs> well, that's the great historian E.H. Carl said many years ago, you have to look at what bees are in people's bonnets, you know, right. yeah. particularly any, any form of medieval report, you know, is going to be, you know, taking a particular viewpoint in one way or another, which is, right. which is what we as historians or as analysts of, of facts have to take into account and it, that is the challenge isn't it because people people will exaggerate and people yeah. will embroider and it's it's a human condition people do that all the time you know yeah. it's very difficult because you're then calling somebody a liar um sir would you like to come in here with any comments observations or anything yep um bev earnshaw in the comments just said something that reminded me of a question that i wanted to ask you gregory mm -hmm. um she said mentioned that uh, she had an out of body experience after being repeatedly kicked in the head and saw herself laying there actually i'm assuming that this is a woman it might not be a woman but um it just made me think about this idea of out of body experiences and ndes 
having a relationship with false awakenings and this idea that the body's under so much stress that it, you know, I'm not saying it's necessarily a purely biological occurrence, but that it may be some sort of spiritual defense mechanism mm. to stop yourself from going through that much trauma. Mm. And I've had lots of uh, false awakening and out of body experiences coming out of the dream state where I don't want to wake up. And obviously a lot of people, if they're in a car crash or something like that, it's so much trauma that a bit like disassociative disorder, you kind of just disassociate at that point because you don't want to be going through so much trauma. So what do you right. think about the those kind of biological body routes towards an NDE? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I think that um, that explains a lot of NDEs where the person was not actually near death at all. Um, there's a whole uh, you know, early publication, Albert Heim, who, who did that um, People Dying from Falls, I can't remember the exact title of it, but it's a whole you know, study of people who, mountain climbers who fell off mountains and basically had you know, full-blown life review and, and NDEs on the way down. And then they land and, and for the most part, they're fine. So they were actually not near death. They didn't temporarily die like someone like Pam Reynolds or whoever. Um, but something in their brain must have been triggered to say, uh-oh, you're dying. You better get this stuff in order. <laughs> Whatever psychological processes you need to do. And, and interestingly, it's often the life review in, in those cases, also with the drowning cases. Um, life review is, is pretty common with those. So um, yeah, I do wonder if it's, um, some of it is, you know, that doesn't mean it's created by the brain, but it's if it's triggered by some kind of biological process to, um, you know, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of just caught them. myself there because I thought like, to what? I, I guess one of my questions on that subject is always like, to what end? Because if the brain thinks you're dying, why does it care if you're going to die peacefully or have your thoughts in order or feel like you're at one with your past? So I read uh, that paper. I think you commented on it as well about this idea of, um, it being a sort of evolutionary defense mechanism that relates to the way animals play dead. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I read yeah, that as well. It's good. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah. I think it's um, like most of the kind of materialist um, reductionist type theories, there's a really excellent, interesting point that might be integrated into the other stuff, but it's not the end of the story. Mm. Yeah, because I just quickly jump in here because one of the um, uh, I've just rewritten re re up for my new book the section on the the the, the Heim um, stories and oh, really? the, the fallings that he described and one of the little snippets of information I discovered that probably Greg you're aware of is that Albert Heim was Einstein's uh, maths teacher I think he was oh, I didn't know that no um, and then it's an interesting uh, interesting angle I take on that which is effectively is that what stim if he was talking to Einstein and saying about these near-death experiences and panoramic life reviews which clearly he would have done because it was his life work and he was interested right. in as an alpine climber uh, that this is what stimulated Einstein's idea of time being relative, because one of the major things that people say when they have these have near death experiences, is time dilation and the idea mm -hmm. that time seems to expand outwards to accommodate the panoramic life review. And I came across a case recently and it's quite disturbing is there was a guy who was climbing somewhere in Yosemite, I think, and he fell off or off the cliff and fell and had a panoramic life review he was falling from the moment of his birth to the point no that's right he wasn't climbing he tripped at the top of a, a cliff mm -hmm. and he had a panoramic life review of his whole life up until the trip then he had another panoramic life review of the falling of the trip then another panoramic life review of him appreciating the fact that he was falling and he was about to die and one of the arguments I've always used is that an awful lot of the panoramic life reviews that take place tends to take place in a scenario whereby you know you're going to die. Hmm. And I think that's absolutely crucial. It's the idea hmm. that there's an anticipation of death mm -hmm. which stimulates the panoramic life review in some way. That's interesting. Um, yeah. 
which again could be you know you, you could as you may very make a perfect point you know is this a kind of a neurological thing and i argue in my cheating the cheating the ferryman hypothesis this is exactly what i argue it is it's neurological and just because it's neurological doesn't mean it's not mysterious right just because it's even possibly brain created maybe a release of endogenous dmt within the brain whether it's 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 um glutamate and the glutamate flood who knows all these issues but just because we come up with a neurological or a neurochemical answer to the question doesn't mean that it's not a real experience mm -hmm. because we have to argue what is real and what we we mean is real right. um just wanted to come in there sarah on that point but please continue i was just gonna um say also this idea of humans developing an idea of having a soul and that things like near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, I think are actually a lot more common and perhaps would have been more common amongst ancient people than they are today. And dreams would have all kind of worked together to create this idea that you weren't just your kind of physical representation on earth. Right. Um, uh, and one of the things, because you were talking about dreams and I do think that an NDE type of experience is possible within a dream and that a lot of NDE accounts sound a lot like lucid dreaming to me. Mm -hmm. And that that sensation of being more real than real is very what I associate with lucid dreaming. Yeah. Um, so especially when it comes to things like the mystery initiation rites and like say shamanic experiences, uh, they seem very similar to me in terms of the kinds of you know, it, it, once you've agreed upon what your body is going to go through when you die, it becomes this narrative structure that, that you then want to kind of uh, sit with and your brain, you know, the way we dream has everything to do with the kind of culture that we absorb and the beliefs that we have. And so the formatting of our afterlife might also be similar. And we had this conversation during our um, Egyptian chat, actually, that maybe uh ndes are something of your own creation but then maybe the afterlife is of your own creation so if you create a beautiful afterlife then you can actually experience that beautiful afterlife for yourself and because you reach a point where time is no longer relevant to you that you mm. can exist in that infinitely right well there's this counter argument to the bardo state anyway isn't it in the bardo mm. state well, you can explain you know, the Tibetan Book of the Dead for us and, and what they mean by the Bardo state. But, Sarah, I think you're spot on there. That's a possibility. What do you think, Greg? Yeah, yeah I think so, too. Um, I mean, that's part of um, kind of where I have gone in my in the last book, too. I felt like um, there is this interesting um, evidence about NDEs, you know, apparently veridical um, cases where, you know, people had... Uh, anomalous inf information retrieval, seeing things in the operating room that they couldn't possibly have seen or whatever. Um, and there are all these differences and there's all these similarities. So I, I wanted to think like, given all the differences and similarities, what kind of possible afterlife could there be if everybody is saying something different? And I think what Sarah was saying is, is um, probably the most possible model that, that it's essentially a lucid dream um, but I don't know if you're, you're probably familiar with H.H. H. Price, who, who wrote a really interesting article for Society for Psychical Research Journal in the 50s. Um, and I don't think that's really been superseded as far as this, this kind of idea goes, that it's, it's not just a lucid dream. So it's not just this totally solipsistic, self-created fantasy. It's basically um, the afterlife is created by the minds of various disembodied dead souls in the other world. So it's a co-created kind of thing um whether that's you know everyone's consciously co-creating it or whether it's just this kind of um you know background effects that that kind of model the reality in a similar way for everybody i don't know but i think that's um that's the only thing to me that can account for similarities and as well as differences um and it's also just what, going back to what you were saying earlier as far as that you know whether it's a physiological process it's always, I think, important to remember that this is talking only about this very brief transition, which may indicate survival after death, but we don't know what happens after the point at which ND ears come back to the body. So, Because that uh, is such a valid point, isn't it? You know, one of the arguments I've used in all my writings and all my books is that my model is it, it's, I never explain what happens after you die. Right. Because the near-death experience, by definition, is a near-death experience right you know and it is it is the the dying brain doing certain things in certain ways mm -hmm. 
but that doesn't invalidate the experience, nor does it invalidate, for instance, the time dilation effects that right. take place. Because if you calculate this, and, and in many ways, I don't know if you've come across the work of, um, oh, S Stein, Steinman. Um, uh, he, there was a guy called John Hick, who was, oh, yeah. um, and he had a, 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 um, an angle on immortality, mm -hmm. death. Right. Uh, he was an English English theologian teaching in America, mm -hmm. and this this new guy, uh, well, comparatively new, is it Steinman, uh, Stein, something or other. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, his argument is that you can you can start to parallel this with virtual reality, and that you could be existing in a virtual reality simulation of your own life, right. uh, which is again the argument I'm taking in my new book. Now, this means that effectively, it's it all happens in the final seconds because if time dilates when you die time can dilate i disagree with one of the writers who says that because time cannot be divided it, it, it can be divided infinitely so mm -hmm. therefore there's an infinite amount of time it doesn't work that way there's something called the planck the planck length and the planck mm -hmm. time you can't divide any more than that but right. if you take zeno's bisection paradox and you apply that to the fact that every second, the next second takes two seconds and the second after that takes four seconds, mm -hmm. you very quickly will realize that you may die, uh, sorry, you may be seen to die by other consciousnesses, mm -hmm. but you never die because your time zone is, is expanding all the time. Right. They're rather like the, 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 the hare and the tortoise. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the hare never catches the tortoise because it's always in front of it. Right. And this is an interesting idea that, you know, there are two levels here. There's, you know, the pre-death world. And this is, again, and it dovetails perfectly into the point we were going to make before about the Bardo state, mm -hmm. you know, and how Evans Vence, you know, wrote, wrote, wrote in and translated it. Right. Because this is a fascinating area, isn't it? Because it's where people face their demons. It's where people right. face all their great fears. Mm -hmm. And again, um, in my book, I did. A, I wrote a book on J.B. Priestley, and J.B. Priestley wrote a play in 1937 called um, Johnson over Jordan, mm -hmm. which is a much. It's very rarely done. I think it's only been performed about three times, mm -hmm. and that's a play about the Bardo state, oh, um, wow. living within your own fears. And of course, one could argue that such books as, for argument's sake, um, A Christmas Carol. Mm -hmm. you know, he's living within a bardo state isn't he yeah. he's going back into his own past and everything yeah. but if you could tell us a little bit about the tibetan bardo state and mm -hmm. and the facility and what that tells us about both that and maybe bond bond tradition within within the shamanic tradition within um the variation of buddhism that you find in tibet you know it's, mm -hmm. it's intriguing isn't it yeah it is um yeah and what i should have said about hh H. price is the the most the Western thinker who, who got it the most right, because I think the Book of the Dead, um, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, um, also, you know, is 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 correct. <laughs> you know, I mean, they, they're they very clear um, about what they're talking about and their knowledge of NDEs. Um, the Bardo states being these kind of self-created, illusory, lucid dream worlds, basically. And, and Tibetans even have a practice called dream yoga, which is essentially, um, you know, learning how to lucid dream. And the point of that is so that you can recognize um, what is illusion, the illusions that you're going to be encountering in, in the Bardo state. So you're supposed to recognize the clear light of pure reason, and this is going to help you to liberate from the continual cycle, cycles of rebirth. But the way it's described in, um, in the Tibetan Book of the Dead is, you know, very clearly like an NDE, and it's step by step going through darkness, coming out into light. And there's even something along the lines of, at least in Evan, Evans Vent's translation, um, those who expect to see the Buddha will see the Buddha. Those who expect to see Jesus will see Jesus. So it's, um, you know, they, yeah, they knew exactly, I think, what, what they were talking about with that. Well, it's almost an application, isn't it, really, of the, of the Ved Vedantic idea of Maya, and yeah. the idea that we all live within this, this, this illusion that we need to break, break out of. And right. that because of the Vedantic concept of the, the single consciousness experiencing itself subjectively, the idea of Brahman, we are all just emanations of Brahman. Mm -hmm. So we're all thoughts of Brahman. We're all dreams of Brahman. Therefore, when, when you die, you just re you, 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 you recreate your world. And again, myself and a couple of associates, you know, we're really working on this idea of egregorial reality. 
you know, the idea of creating an egregore, the idea of creating a tulpa, which again reverts back, doesn't it, to the mm -hmm. ideas of tulpas within Tibetan Buddhism mm -hmm. um, and the idea that we can make mind creations. Now, if we can make mind creations, it means we can create by our mind the reality we're living within mm -hmm. or the reality we are experiencing in some way. Mm -hmm. um, and you follow through your, almost your own dream sequences mm -hmm. in those final moments of your life. And of course, then you, you apply quantum physics never its many worlds interpretation and, and the, the idea of even David Bohm's work, you know, it's all mm -hmm. saying there's a deeper level of reality that we can dive into. Right. That, yeah. that we are just an emanation of the implicate and explicate orders. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think your work is so important because you're, you're taking these things and I'm putting them in a cultural hmm. position, you know, right. and it, I was going to say, sir, have you got any other points there? I was just going to say, what about um, in the Tibetan tradition, the idea of reincarnation and NDEs actually leading to being reborn again and that those memories are able to be held by some people? Yeah, yeah intermission states of, um, yeah, remembering well, it wouldn't be an NDE anymore because the person actually did die and, and were reborn. So it just, but I guess the NDE state is the same state as that intermission period. And that's the period where you, you know, supposedly remember the different incarnations you've gone through. And it's kind of a, a many lives review, I guess, before being reborn into the, into the next state. So, um, I mean, that's, uh, that's one of those things that I think is, I don't know. I wouldn't. I don't know if I would go so far as to say culturally conditioned, but it's kind of culturally occurring. I don't know many Western NDEs where people come back and say, "I remembered all the lives that I lived mm. in previous times." So, but it, could that also be because it's a skill that's cultivated by the religious practice? Yeah, yeah, that's possible. Um, I mean, I I tend to think that. Um, I mean, I don't I don't believe in the supernatural because I just don't think that any of this stuff even if it does happen, should be considered supernatural. So <laughs> I, I think that there's, it's, if there is survival after death, if there's reincarnation, um, you know, if NDEs are genuine experiences of the soul leaving the body and all that, um, we just haven't found the type of naturalism that can accommodate them yet. So if we look at it in that, from that point of view, um, I don't, so, I also don't see any problem with some people reincarnating and some people going to, you know, Victorian summer land and some people going to um, horrible hellish state or whatever. Um, and maybe that's not necessarily entirely generated by our own minds like a lucid dream. Maybe there is just sort of, this is just what happens to some people, just like, um, you know, some people are, are born with a sixth finger or some people die of cancer and some people die of AIDS or whatever you know it's like there's a lot of things that are completely beyond our control that we don't understand about our lives and how um, evolutionary processes work um, physical processes so what actually happens to our soul and consciousness might just be random you know <laughs> it might just be some people reincarnated some aren't and or or maybe it depends partly on prior beliefs if, if you think you're going to be reincarnated you are but but then that doesn't explain some of these Western examples. So. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? The whole point of reincarnation, again, in my new book, I have a section on reincarnation. Um, and because the, 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 the differences culturally on the process of reincarnation, you know, the Tlingit Indians in, mm -hmm. in or the, the indigenous Native Americans in the Pacific Northwest, you know, they have different ideas of how long the soul disappear disappears and comes back again is reincarnated again whether mm -hmm. you're reincarnated within clan groups whether you're reincarnated as animals and each culture culture has subtle differences they're almost so different you know the mm -hmm. the reincarnation beliefs of um the druze for instance in lebanon right. are, are, are very very different um so we we were not dealing here with one consistent thing or theme right. but your point is an incredibly valid one that if you your culture believes it or you believe in it strongly enough you manifest it and it becomes that i mean i i've spent my life being intrigued i'm not a religious person but i've spent my life being intrigued as to how highly intelligent people 
can believe things that I consider to be illogical. Mm -hmm. And it is because I'm now coming to believe that it's because their worldview is structured in such a way that it continually reinforces their belief systems, mm -hmm. like the people who saw the sun spinning in the sky in Fatima. Right. You know, so many people saw that. It was mm -hmm. a genuine phenomenon. But was it a kind of a, a collective hallucination, which is just as real? And indeed, one of the a fascinating point that's been made by B.B. Earnshaw uh, in terms of this is, have either of you studied Christian science by Murray Baker Eddy? And of course, Christian science says this, doesn't it? You know, mm. Christian science... And one of our mutual friends here, um, who's a previous guest on this show, Kaz Coronel, was brought up in a Christian science environment. Mm -hmm. You know, this idea that everything is, is created by your mind, illness is created by your mind. Right. You know, and could it be that we all, we create our own, as Charles Pierce said, our own phanerons, mm -hmm. our own worlds mm -hmm. that we live within and we experience within them yeah. um, in some way. We're all, as um, the character aims in the film vanilla sky said we're all living the dream we're all living the dream and could that be what's going on totally philosophical nonsense i'm spouting out here but just in terms <laughs> no, of uh, area for discussion it's an interesting one isn't it it is yeah and in, in some very real sense um we are also participants in creating this reality in this world that we live in maybe in a um you know, possibly more powerless sense <laughs> on an individual basis than we might be in an, in a next disembodied world but um you know the only reason things are like this on this planet is because of us um who else is doing it to us you know so um i don't know maybe um maybe it's just a similar kind of thing but just on a different level well almost you know to the point of the discovery of subatomic particles i'm reminded of um the nobel prize winner uh uh, e. e. Rabi, uh, when they discovered the muon, <laughs> because what was happening was the scientists kept thinking of subatomic particles in order, almost like the epicycles of the, the medieval schoolmen to explain retrograde motion. They just think of a yeah. subatomic particle as they needed it to fit in. <laughs> and bang, there it was. Yeah. And one day they, they discovered the muon. Rabi, Rabi was so shocked by this or amused by this, he turned around and said, who ordered that? Wow. It was as if it was a Chinese takeaway they just ordered, because there it was, and it manifests itself. Yeah. And clearly there is strong evidence that, that beliefs, and probably you particularly in your studies of religion and religious belief systems, you know, it'd be interesting to, 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 to have your viewpoint on this and as to how beliefs can really create, well, they definitely create cultures, don't they? You know, there's no mm. doubt about that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um... I don't know. I mean, it, it does, that kind of gets up to borrow a phrase from, from Paul Badham, who was my, my supervisor at Lampeter, that, that I get to my boggle, th boggle threshold at that point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, when it's actually, you know, self-creating things in this physical reality, things like the, the Muon example, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I know there are accounts like this and, you know, there's things like Sai Baba's miracles or whatever, but um, I think if I were, to experience them myself, I might believe them, but um, I, I I don't really believe anything. I, I feel like I know things or I don't know them, and mm. uh, so that's kind of that way. Um, I think it's a very valid valid point, isn't it? That we really, as the old statement says, you know, you can keep an open mind as long as your brain falls doesn't fall out, and yeah. in many ways that is the case where people can be extremely credulous because they want to believe. Mm -hmm. uh, I, for instance, I was quite interested, and we could have a discussion about this now. You touched upon the Pam Reynolds case, mm -hmm. and I, I hear a great deal about the Pam Reynolds case as, as one of the classic cases of a near-death experience that, that proved a veridical knowledge and everything else as well. Mm -hmm. And yet, if you go back to the actual source material, and when you go back to the reports that were taken by the doctors that did the operation and did the standby effect all of her veridical things that she reported took place before standby had taken place before she'd been flatlined oh, right. for instance they mentioned don't they that she had she remembers knowing that the nurses were having difficulty in 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 putting the 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 intubate intub 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 into her thigh into the her groin mm -hmm. And people have used this as examples that she as she was flatlined at that time and couldn't have possibly known about this. But a bit of logic applies here. The reason they were trying to put the things into her groin was because 
she hadn't been flatlined yet. That was part mm -hmm. of the process in order right. to flatline her. But some of the things, the other things that she described are intriguing, you know, and you mm -hmm. have to say, you know, the, the listening to, um, wasn't it listening to Hotel California and the surgeons right. chatting to each other. But sometimes the, we the can get a pitch of the bone saw as well. That's one that's the what? The, the pitch of the bone saw. Apparently she had yes, perfect yes, pitch. Yes, that, was, was that was extraordinary. Yeah. And yet one of the things that I always found surprising was that she never reported the fact that her head was actually had bolts in her head to keep her straight. So she mm. didn't move yeah. and she didn't see those. She didn't report right. those. And it always intrigues me that she didn't, there's things that she didn't see mm. as if it was kind of almost a, a kind of a, a cliche of what she expected to be having, have traveling or having around her right. um, as well. But it's very, very intriguing here in terms of your experiences of near death cases are the ones that you think, wow, that's a classic. That really is one that I think lends credibility to the case of veridical experiences. Um, I would say as far as the historical ones and the cross-cultural ones in indigenous societies and things like that, um, um, I wouldn't, I don't think, I can't think of any from, from those contexts. And that's, that's partly because of, you know, why and how and where they were recorded, mm -hmm. um, and when, because most of them are, are quite old and they weren't really concerned with, you know, um, recording those kinds of details. Um, I, I think the ones that actually intrigue me the most are the, the peak in Darien experiences, mm. which um, for, for any viewers who don't know, that's when a person uh, dies and, you know, allegedly dies, goes to the other world and meets somebody who they believe is alive on earth. And, you know, it might be confusing to them. Like, why am I seeing, you know, uncle Helen, uncle Helen. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, well, he, he obviously him. made a big more change. confusing. <laughs> he, yeah, he, he transitioned on the, it was part of his transformation. But um, anyway, and so they, they come back to, to this world and they find out that Uncle Helen um, just died that morning, right, when that person was having their NDE. And there's no possible way um, that they could have known this because they were unconscious and, and in this near-death state at the time. And there are cross-cultural examples of that, which, which are pretty interesting. Um, and the, the other ones where um, somebody sees somebody that they didn't actually know in life and then later identifies them from a photograph and they're told, oh, that was your grandfather or, or whatever. And to me, those are, I don't know, maybe, I don't know if I would say more impressive, but at least equally as impressive as the kind of out-of-body vertical experience mm -hmm. things because um, I think they're less open to um, uh, debunking and scientific um, dissection to the point where, you know, every, every aspect of them can be questioned. If, um, that person who was temporarily dead or in a near-death state, um, literally did not know that that person had died, I, I don't know how else that can be explained, so. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, one of the ones that, um, astounds me every time I read it is the Ivan Alexander, um, case, mm -hmm. if for nothing more than his encounter with his dead sister, Right. Yeah. Um, whereby he he dies. He has this um, real problem with his brain, and uh, he he's virtually flatlined. He is somebody that doesn't believe in near death experiences or anything like it, or life after death. And he finds himself on the wings of a, a giant butterfly, right. and he meets this beautiful young girl or young woman who had a very specific color hair, uh, or no, was her eyes? I think wasn't it? It was the color of her eyes. And she speaks to him and explains things to him. And when he came back, he mentioned this to his parents. And it was his sister who had died before he was born that he didn't know existed. And she had this, these particular colored eyes. Right. Now, again, that is something that he couldn't have possibly known. Mm -hmm. um, and clearly that is information. Of course, one can say, well, you know, he could have known it subliminally. He could have his parents could have written about it but they are things that you know you cannot explain right in and any other, than, other than accusing them of having made it up that's, correct that's the the only alternative isn't it yeah. if you you are but you know people do make things up i mean this this that's is true. a challenge yeah you know? my mum told me that i ate my twin in the womb <laughs> <laughs> um and how true was that sarah i'm not sure because um my brothers are twins 
And I, I've never actually checked with my mum, but she told me once that I was a twin originally and then I ate the other one. But, you know, and I did read that apparently twins sometimes absorb the other twin. So I might have absorbed the other twin. And a lot wow. of twins are left-handed as well, apparently. Well, one of them is. That's intriguing, isn't it? Wow. Yeah. Well, the fact that she chose the term eight rather than absorb. Yeah, I thought that was good. <laughs> um, Nella brings up a really good point. She said... Um, the idea of us carrying memories from our ancestors could potentially be seen as a form of reincarnation of one shape and another. And she also brought up a great point, which I had forgotten to mention about um, the possibility of people that have been congenitally, bl congenitally blind seeing in an NDE experience, which to me is like a pretty incredible indicator of the um, veracity of NDEs. Yeah, that, those, those are really amazing. But more than the ones about children, I mean, I know a lot of people make make a big deal about children having NDEs and they didn't have enough knowledge or culture to even know that they would meet Jesus. But I don't really buy that because our culture is so permeated with, you know, dualistic imagery and religious imagery mm -hmm. that um, I think even like a two year old would probably be primed to have <laughs> a certain kind of NDE. Yeah, there was a, re a, a recent case I read whereby a young boy had had claimed that his, his his parents had been murdered and he claimed that he was he was he was helped by this this man mm -hmm. and he said why did the man who helped me come off the cross because huh. he went to church and and, right. uh, and and Christians have applied that and said well this is evidence that it was Jesus well, not particularly, because the evidence from history suggests that Jesus would have been clean shaven and wouldn't have looked like a typical Anglo-Saxon American man with a beard and long yeah. hair. He would look Middle Eastern and would have probably been clean shaven. So yeah. clearly what is happening here is that it's it's an archetype, isn't mm -hmm. it? You know, people see archetypes, religious archetypes or whatever they are. And I'd argue that these whatever these are, they are there to make somebody feel at ease. So mm -hmm. whatever is needed, you know, they're the being of light. In near-death experiences you know I've, I've had reports of children who's the being of light has been mickey mouse it's been right. elvis presley it's been their school teacher or their best friend and people who are living you yeah. know so yeah. again we have the kind of phantoms of the living mm -hmm. worldview you know here yeah. so clearly it's it's a lot more complex and the vicky unipeg case which is the case i think sarah that we're mentioning here which is the blind lady who claimed that she could see yeah. It's a very interesting case, but just to play devil's advocate here, how did she know what she was seeing? If she'd never seen anything, how would she know what she was seeing, if that makes any sense? Mm. Um, you'd know it was different, wouldn't you? You would. You would know it was different. You, I'd agree. You, you would say that it is unusual. Now, if, if that can be believed, that is very, very powerful. I mean, it's Kenneth Ring, isn't it? I think that did the work on 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 the blind seeing and in, in right, yeah. experiences. But if that can be if that can be shown, that is very powerful. The question is, isn't it? We should be able to do experiments on this, but it would be eth ethically so difficult to do, wouldn't it? Really, sadly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the Penny Sartori did to hers, and you know, there were these ones where they're putting uh, symbols on tops of mm. machinery and cardiac wards and just reminded me of what you, you said about Pam Reynolds. She didn't see the own, you know, physical state that she was in with bolts in her head. Um, and I know with uh, some of Penny's cases, they said things like, well, we didn't know to look there. You know, why didn't you tell us to look out for yeah. the symbol? Um, they were so concerned with, you know, seeing their own dead body lying there. Yeah. Which, which as as they out. said, you know, it was the last thing I was thinking was looking at symbols. You know, I was yeah. traumatized because I was floating outside of my body. You know, right. there are much better cases than that, you know, like the uh, Pim Van Lommel and the dentures. Right. There are, there are very interesting cases. And I know that Penny, you know, I've interviewed Penny on a couple of occasions and Penny and I have done events together. And mm. some of Penny's cases are absolutely extraordinary. Yeah. You know, and clearly veridical, inf people can see veridically outside of the body. You know, mm. again, a previous guest on this show is Graham Nichols, mm. who has out of the body experiences. And some of Graham's cases are, I really suggest you check, you check his work out, by the way. Mm -hmm. It is really intriguing. I mean, he had a precognitive out-of-body experience where in an out-of-body experience, he perceived an event that was that took place five days later. And he mm -hmm. saw it in the exact location. It was a bombing of a pub in London in 1999. Mm -hmm. Five days before the bombing of the Admiral Duncan pub in Soho, 
Graham not only saw it in and out of the body experience, but when he came to reported it to five individuals, all of whom have signed sworn affidavits, wow. that this is what he said. Yeah. So again, you know, we were talking about the 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 um, the, the skeptics here. Mm. You know, there's only one conclusion that yeah. can be made: either he was precognitive, or him and a group are just lying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, there is no yeah. fallback position, is there? You That's know? true. I mean, I've I've had um, there's one just totally ridiculous sort of pre precognitive dream I had, which um, things like this make me think: okay, there's there's some kind of purpose or structure for for this to happen you know there's a, a reason that he could have that he had that dream possibly to or a vision in order to um you know warn the people or or somehow prevent it from happening maybe catch the perpetrators but um but i i had this this dream where um the woman the actress who played the woman in uh, creature from the black lagoon the old 1950s yeah. movie um this was just very prominent in my dream and she was talking to me and I think maybe trying to tell me something I don't remember. Um, this was a couple of years ago and the next, and I, I don't even, I still to this day don't remember her name. I, I was not thinking about her. Um, the next morning I was, you know, having breakfast and looking through the news and she had died that night, um, which is just so completely random. Uh, and I just, to this day, I'm so puzzled by it because to me it was, you know, that's a veridical experience because you know, it happened to me and, and there's no more specific thing that could have happened this completely random person. Um, but I have no idea, you know, what possible reason there could have been for having that experience. That's, that's the thing that's so mundane, isn't it? I call yeah. them mundane duns, you know, mm -hmm. J.W. Dunn, the um, Irish, uh, Anglo-Irish aeronautical, aeronautical engineer, when he wrote the book in 1927 or 29, mm -hmm. um, An Experiment with Time. Uh -huh. And Dunn argues, you know, that we we dream we dream precognitively quite regularly, and we have regular precognitive dreams of our own immediate future. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes these come into our minds, and we remember them. Mm -hmm. But they're mundane; they are yeah. powerfully mundane. Um, and again, in my new book, I have a whole section on a group of letters that were sent to J. B. Priestley mm -hmm. in the early 1960s of people describing their precognitive experiences. And again, J.B. Priestley wrote a play based upon Dunn's theories uh, called um, uh, Time and the Conways, mm -hmm. you know, and the idea that you can you can glimpse your own future and then take that information back in time sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, isn't it? Why do we have these recognitions? Now, a friend, a, a young man who contacted me a few years ago um, has um, a, a, a benign tumor on his pineal gland. Mm. And he literally is a rocket scientist. He was training to be a rocket scientist and he's, he's now post postdoctoral researcher in rocket science, as far as I'm aware. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me that he, he gets powerful deja vu sensations. Um, and in the powerful deja vu sensations, he's no, he knows what's going to happen in the next two to three seconds. Mm -hmm. And I, I, when I met him, I said, well, why don't you say something? Why don't you turn around and say, I know what you're going to say to me? And he said a profoundly influenced and it influenced me so much in terms of my own writings. He turned around and he said, if you were about if you were about to say something to me now. And then I told you what you were about to say to me, you wouldn't say it. <laughs> and it's true. Yeah. The very fact of acknowledging that you're precognitive to say something is going to happen. Invalidates it. Yeah. But I was doing a BBC radio program a few years ago on Deja Vu on mm. live on BBC BBC radio. And um, while we're doing, we're doing a phone in and somebody, mm -hmm. some guy phoned in and he said, you know, what Anthony Peake's talking about here is what happened to him. He was watching television with his wife and suddenly he knew he could hear what there was an echo of what the person was saying on the television. Mm -hmm. And he was about three or four seconds out of time. It so disturbed him. He got up and he walked into his living, into his um, hallway to see somebody walk past the glass door and walk past again. It was almost like the, wow. the cat sequence in the matrix, you know, the deja vu yeah. sequence of the cat. And then he realized he could prove he was being precognitive. So what he did was he got hold of a piece of paper and a pen and he sat outside the living room and he waited until he heard what his wife was about to say to him as he walked in through the door. Mm -hmm. And as she said it in his mind, he wrote it down on a piece of paper, folded it 
and walked in and she said the words and he handed her the piece of paper wow. and on the piece of paper were the written words. Now, to me, that is powerful proof mm. of something here. Mm -hmm. Now, is it a switch in time? You know, is it our, is our specious present moving outwards in some way? Mm. And is deja vu just an extension of the specious present, you know, in some way? Mm. Um, you know, like your precognition, it was profoundly mundane and there was self-evidently nothing you could do to present, prevent that woman's death. Mm. But presumably you were precognizing you, as J.W. Dunn would say, you were precognizing your experience of it, reading it in the newspaper or hearing it on the on the television. And mm. it back creates it into your dream the night before. Right. Um, yeah. That's interesting. Because somebody's asking a question here, which, again, is a really excellent point. And it's 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 one of our friends. Um, well, there's Nella has mentioned it as well. And uh, Dr. Wong Chi, who is, is a mutual friend of ours about the overlap between DMT uh, and the experiences of dimethyltryptamine and the NDE. Mm -hmm. And again, I'd, I'd add to that is the, the experience of ketamine, mm -hmm. because I know that uh, Carl Janssen at the Maudsley Hospital a few years ago wrote a very interesting paper about the parallels between NDE experiences and ketamine experiences. Right. And I was wondering, you know, if you had any ideas on this, on, on that and hallucinogens and whether there is a link here. Yeah, there's another one um, called Ibogaine, which is, uh, yes. yeah, that's um, the Fung people in uh, southwestern Africa, I think. Um, yeah, and that's that's one that um, I wrote about in my, my book that it very much is uh, an attempt to replicate NDEs, and it is, you know, pretty much indistinguishable from, from NDEs. So I think that... Um, yeah, certain drug experiences like that, DMT and ketamine is, um, I mean, the only thing I can think of is it's, um, you know, accessing the same type of reality um, or, or replicating the experience in, a, in the same way that a shamanic practice would. Um, but it's difficult. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's, that's one way to look at it, or you could look at it as suggesting um, that's further proof that NDEs are all in the brain and that it's not a metaphysical thing if they can just be, you know, created by, in a chemical kind of way, which is not even um, causing a near-death state, so. But that's falling back on the argument that already irritates me when people turn around and say, well, we can replicate the NDE and it could be caused by the release of endogenous DMT within the brain. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, that, that was it may be, but effectively the whole of reality that we perceive is created by the reaction of electricity with, with neurochemicals within the brain. Right. Our, our overall perceptions are all created by neurochemical reactions. It doesn't mean that reality isn't real. Yeah. Just because, you know, the thing is, the question I've, I've said on many, many occasions, you know, we dismiss things because we say it's an hallucination. Well, mm -hmm. it's all very clever. It's a label. It's label yeah. theory. It's label dismissal. We, nobody knows what hallucinations are. Mm -hmm. Oliver Sacks, in his famous book, Hallucinations, just before he died, mm -hmm. went through. He talked about Charles Bonnet syndrome, talked about all these uh, folie d'oeuvres and everything else. We don't know what hallucinations are. Right. In fact, we could argue, extrapolate from that to say that the whole of your life experience is an hallucination mm. on the same token. So it's a very dubious point of view. One could argue that maybe these chemicals are the things that facilitate consciousness to occur within whatever this simulation is, you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah. because I don't know. Have you come across the work of Jimo Borgijin no. at all? Okay. Mm -hmm. she's, a, she's a researcher at the University of Michigan. Uh, and in 2017, herself and her team um, managed to, and this is extraordinary, um, and it's, not, it's horrible what they did, but they gave live rats electric shocks mm -hmm. while they, 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 they had them on EEGs. Mm -hmm. And the, the rats died, and around about 17 seconds afterwards, there was a huge spike in neural, neuronal activity. Mm -hmm. And they concluded this could be evidence of the NDE, you know, that they, they were technically dead, but the brain yeah. just suddenly sparked into life mm -hmm. and what was it doing yeah. what what experience is it generating and indeed could it generate any experience if the consciousness that was perceiving the whatever the rat's brain was perceiving whatever a rat's soul is mm. what was it doing it for mm. so we're getting to some quite interesting areas here in terms yeah. of neurology and neurochemistry mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah. It makes yeah. me think of the sort of collective soul idea of Steiner um, and this idea that we have this collective unconscious and in Jungian terms, it relates to the archetypes as well. But this idea that there are these different levels of existence and spiritual reality and we're in the material realm. And I think um, Chi just mentioned there's I think there's seven planes of existence and that some of what occurs in the material realm is first formulated in these spiritual dimensions, eventually filtering into material reality. Mm. I mean, it's a different, we just have such a different worldview now. And I think because for a lot of people, especially in the West, we don't have a sense of the divine or a divine creator. We're not having the same sort of um, near death experiences that we might have had when people were more religious in this in this region right yeah although even you know atheists and skeptics have ndes that are transformative and even if they might not make them fully believe in a deity or in even in the nde itself it's still they're still transformative positive experiences which is interesting and and most of them do you know convert their beliefs mm. so, well, well it comes down to doesn't it you know empiricism and in, in, in empiricism means from experience. Mm -hmm. you know? So when you're saying it's empirically proven, well, it's empirically proven by somebody witnessing something. You know, scientists mm -hmm. do experiments and they repeat them, but mm -hmm. they are still somebody perceiving the results of the experiment. Right. You know, and it, it is sometimes people I find don't think deeply enough. They, they go down to a certain level, but they don't then jump to the, the deeper conclusions of exactly yeah. what they're trying to say when they're dismissing these phenomena, you know, and... And they do, you know, there is this, this plague of material reductionism and eliminative materialism. People like Daniel Dennett, who believes mm. that we are fooling ourselves to even thinking we're conscious. Mm. What? <laughs> Utterly ludicrous. Yeah. But nevertheless, people like the Churchans and Daniel Dennett, you know, these are the things they genuinely believe. Yeah. So there is, you know, there's scientism here. And it's researchers like yourself that are so important because what you're doing is you're taking a very objective sensible rational viewpoint of yes. people's experiences hmm. you know yeah i mean i i in religious studies um it's there's so much um hermeneutic, hermeneutics of suspicion they call it essentially mm -hmm. where um the, the stance is that uh even though all of our information is gained from you know the sources from which we get it it's, it sounds good it's stupidly obvious to say but there would be no nothing to study if there weren't people telling us about their religious experiences and beliefs and writing their texts and giving them to us. Um, we should question everything that they say about their own beliefs and their own experiences. Um, whereas I prefer to honor the accounts of the people I'm studying and give some kind of um, you know precedence to their experience and at least believe that something like that happened. And since I'm working with historical material anyway, there's there's no other choice. Either you say, um, you know, the the 70 accounts of NDEs that I found in North America, they all must be lying. They all must be copying each other out of culture, cultural uh, diffusion, um, or they actually had experiences of the kind they're they're describing because other people elsewhere in the world also do. That's kind of the path I I prefer to take to actually, you know, believe the sources. Not necessarily their interpretations. Um, I, I don't necessarily believe any kind of supernatural claim um, that an indigenous society will make about themselves. But you know, you can believe that something happened. That's a very valid point, isn't it? You know, it's the it's the veneer put on top. It's the interpretation, mm -hmm. whereas the the pure experience is what we need to understand. Right. And I think, you know, in, in years gone by, an awful lot of researchers who are researching the mystical experience, you mm -hmm. know, Evelyn Underwood, for instance, right. you know, you read her work and it's fascinating because she's just, she just describes the experiences as they are. Mm -hmm. And it's always that when these things are intensely personal and people have intensely personal religious experiences and it changes their lives, you know, mm -hmm. as, as Penny Satori has said, you know, the, the changes that people have when they have near-death experiences are extraordinary. Mm. Now, to call these people naive mm -hmm. and to call them stupid because they're interpreting their own experiences from their own experiences and from their own knowledge is, is arrogant. Mm. 
I you know, know or, and the implication is often, you know, if you follow the, the so-called logic to its conclusion, they're basically always saying these people are lying. You know, mm -hmm. they're saying they are making up, making it up. They just think that they had the experience they had. Um, they invented it while they were recounting it, which makes you wonder what were they recounting if there was no experience to begin with? So there's all this like circular logic to even deny that somebody had an experience. And that's not even to say that that experience was genuinely metaphysical. You know, it's just mm -hmm. to argue that there can be no such experience without being, it being culturally created or linguistically created. So on the, I mean, on the linguistically or culturally influenced is one thing, but um, there is such a thing as experience that happens to all of us, regardless of our cultural language. So, and then and then you have the complete denial of the role of the experiencer inside the head. You know, the the experience that is experiencing these things isn't right. experiencing anything because the person inside the head doing the experiencing is being fooled right. by his own brain to believe he actually exists, and you get these. These incredible, it's almost like how many angels are dancing on the head of a pin. You know, it yeah. is. And I thought you were going to say, how many angels does it take to change the light bulb? <laughs> <laughs> yes. What's the answer? <laughs> Only one, probably. They're pretty good at that sort of thing, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they just put angel dust on it and it works very well. R right. Um, have we got any other questions coming through from anybody? Uh, it's, uh, it does seem to be fairly active in there. Yeah, there's, um, well, Nella's had obviously an NDE herself. So, she, you know, and I think it's very true that it's a bit like when I do lucid dream workshops, you often have a lot of people that have never had a lucid dream. And so describing what a lucid dream is, uh, is pretty difficult. And for people that have actually had an NDE, any amount of talking, reading, thinking about it can't compare to the actual gnosis of that NDE experience. Right. Um, it, one of the things that I wanted to mention before you go, Gregory, is, um, uh, have you done much research into Haitian rituals around zombification? Because I find that really intriguing when it comes to this idea of near death. So this is where um, zombie witch, zombie kind of, uh, well, witch doctors in Haiti um, create a medicine to give someone the look of being completely dead and they can right. be uh they can be written off as dead in the hospital and because in Haiti I think they want to bury bodies quite quickly because of the humidity mm -hmm. they get buried and then a bit later on the witch doctor will come and dig them up and give them another potion which contains datura which mm -hmm. is one of these things uh, a sort of mind control um, medicine wow. and uh, it's just an extraordinary and terrifying uh, process that they go through yeah. and these people because they're fed they're constantly drip fed datura will be the slaves of these witch doctors. And within the culture, I think it's said that these people have done awful things. Um, and that's why they're punished in this way. But have you read, have you um, studied this much? I haven't, I, I know about as much as you said. And in fact, I didn't yeah. even know about the, the death tour, but yeah, that's, it's, it's a really interesting phenomenon. So, yeah, there was a, a Vice documentary on the Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia series oh, okay. and it was quite terrifying. Yeah, I'll bet. I, I wonder if, uh, you know, any of them came to and had NDE reports. Well, that's before. what I was wondering, like what the experience was for those people. But I know with Datura, when I've uh, read about it previously, is like complete memory loss. So um, oft they don't, you know, they can be told people are mugged often when they're um, poisoned with Datura and they're told to take money out of their bank account and they just do it. Wow. They just comply. So it yeah. is uh, really scary. Yeah, that that's is. interesting in itself, isn't it? It means that the personality, the controlling personality that we ex that exists within our head can be can be eradicated can mm. be wiped away switched off yeah. and switched off you yeah. know and it's it's again this switching off and of course a lot of the work that people like uh um hammerhoff you mm. know uh, th that's doing the idea of anesthesiology you know and and um chi is a consultant anesthesiologist by the way dr bong Mm -hmm. uh, or is an anesthesiologist anyway and one of the things that we, that chi and i have discussed is you know where does how does where does consciousness go when anesthetics are applied and indeed as as we have discussed we know the mechanisms whereby these chemicals react within the brain with the neurotransmitters and everything mm -hmm. but nobody knows how it switches off everything Right. They don't know that. Nobody knows how anesthetics actually work. Hmm. Really makes you think as well about how what the relationship is between what we think of as consciousness and memory itself. 
Mm. Memory is obviously so critical to the the concept of consciousness. I think I think its mm. role is really underrated as far as consciousness is concerned. I can't. Mm. I don't know if I remember that, but <laughs> sorry. But yes, it is, isn't it? And and presumably, you know, within religious studies, it must be quite fascinating as well. The use of you know we've talked upon the use of hallucinogenic substances, but effectively historically within religious groups, this is what would have been people get themselves don't they you know the sufis get themselves by spinning mm. and everything else as well into altered states of consciousness yeah to 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 app app apprehend god i suppose mm. isn't it mm. to the, the spiritual world we do it by changing all the chemicals in our brain in one way or another yeah yeah that goes back to the the dmt ketamine thing it's it's not necessarily through drugs um and again there's the ibogaine there's also um uh, peyote psilocybin there's all kinds of you know uh, ritual and theogens that people use to get into these states but also it doesn't necessarily have to be drugs like you said it's um, mm. sufi spinning or the native american ghost dance where they you know dance and repeatedly chanting and drumming for long long periods of time until they collapse um i mean during that time they have it in their heads that when they collapse they're going to have this you know nde type shamanic experience but it's that collapse that that brings it about um, or the shaker church there's all kinds of you know physical deprivations and um physical focus and mental focus that you know can bring about these kinds of states which you know i hadn't realized that you know that within within the protestant tradition mm. of the shakers yeah i'd never re i never thought that before yes of course though because they were getting themselves into an altered state weren't they yeah and then there's the there's a, the indian shaker church which is different from mm. the regular one and that was actually founded by somebody who had an NDE and came back and, you know, brought this technique to, to the group and, and, you know, tried to get them to help them access the same reality that he did in, in his NDE. So. Interesting because it didn't, is it Ellen White who founded the Seventh-day Adventists? Yeah, I, think I think she so. had a near-death experience as well, didn't she? I yeah. think. Yeah. I mean, there's loads of um, religious movements that were founded on, on NDEs. Just, yeah one could argue even the mormons really you know yeah. joseph smith and his experience with moroni the the angel you know could right. have been right and there are loads of 19th century mormon nde accounts i mean they they were very meticulous about recording them and keeping the records so yes because i cited in my first book now i remember one of the earliest accounts was it was a mormon record Mm. Of, of somebody who had a near-death experience when they were moving out west to salt lake city when they, they left Nauvoo, right. very interesting yeah, yeah isn't it so so you start to realize that near-death experiences are a way of of uh, acquiring god or, or seeing the other world in some way yeah mm. Mm. but again what happens after that point who knows <laughs> i mean because I would say even if they're completely veridical and all this, the stories of out-of-body experiences are true, after that point, maybe we die. <laughs> yeah, and then we die. Yeah, absolutely. And then that would be a bit disappointing. But I guess you wouldn't care at that point because yeah, you would have had you this disappointed if amazing experience. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's almost the opposite of Pascal's wager, isn't it? You know, well, you know, worship God because if he if I die and he's not there, it doesn't matter. But then right. there's the thing: if you die, you don't go to heaven either. You don't go anywhere. Um, right which is which an interesting point as well. Right, well, this has been an absolutely fascinating discussion. It's been Definitely. really enjoyable. Um, I think we've, we've got onto some quite interesting discussions that uh, I hadn't planned on going to um, and thoroughly enjoyed it. Greg, can you tell us a little bit finally um, about your, any future work you're doing and then how people can contact you and get involved in your work or read about your work? Sure, yeah, thanks. Um... Uh, the next book is, it's coming out with White Crow Publishers, you, you probably know, they're a kind of specialize in parapsychological. Oh, right, literature. White Crow, yes, he's a friend yeah. of mine. What's his name? Um, John Beecher. On, yeah, John's been on the show, yes, of course. Oh, right, great, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's going to be called The Next World, and with the subtitle, Extraordinary Experiences and the Origins of the Afterlife. And that's, it's kind of my my manifesto <laughs> it's it's going to kind of have a, a, a sort of overview of of a lot of the stuff that i've done a lot of stuff we've, we've talked about today um not just with the ancient stuff the summary of that and some of the indigenous stuff but i'm also looking at um edwardian mediumship accounts of afterlife um which you know mediums supposedly transmitted from spirits of the dead in the other world and describing you know what it's like there 
Um, and also, as Sarah brought up, um, intermission memories and what those states of um, between re reincarnations were like, according to, to different accounts. So, um, yeah, that's just kind of a um, collection of, of all these different studies, which will, will kind of be brought together. And with the ultimate goal of looking at, again, what kind of afterlife could possibly, you know, be conceivable in light of all these similarities and differences. So is that, and then a long um, ongoing project is uh, the historical anthology of near-death experiences. And that's, um, it's just gonna be probably quite a large book, which is collecting lots and lots of source material going back to, you know, the ancient Sumer account I mentioned and, and uh, the Greek accounts and Native American and, and all these accounts from around the world, just in their entirety. So people can read you know, these, these full NDEs in chronological order. It's going to basically be a world's history of NDEs without a lot of commentary or analysis. It's kind of a source book, so. And how can people contact you if they, they or your website or whatever? Yeah, website, uh, gregoryshushan.com, um, all the social media, usual stuff. You can find me with Gregory Shushan. Uh, Patreon as well, I'm on there. So yeah, it's, it's pretty easy. Wonderful. Thank you. That's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Anthony. It's been great. Wonderful. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. We need to have we need to have a general chat on other matters. There's so much area of overlap in, yeah, in our areas of research. To. I would love to continue chatting with you on this. Uh, right. Thanks very much. And thanks everybody for listening in. Um, this will be uploaded onto Facebook, uh, to, onto YouTube, probably tomorrow now. Um, but thanks for listening in. And as always, thanks for Sarah in the background for um all her hard work in making this happen and the wonderful posters that she's now doing as well, which is really terrific. Um, our next guest uh, will um, be joining us next week um, and we're gonna have a fascinating discussion on the latest research on uh, precognition in autistic children, um, which will be a fascinating discussion. It will be a returning guest as well. So we'll look forward to that as well. So everybody see you all next week and thanks very much for listening in and glad to be back on the, the booking bronco, eh, Sarah? Okay, then? Okay, bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.